Hello and welcome to the Mind Body Soil podcast, a podcast where we explore the innate connection between the mind, the body and the soil. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Smart Soil. Smart Soil is an online education platform creating courses and providing resources from farmers for farmers. Join us as we share the stories and experiences from those dedicated to regenerating ecosystems, communities and human beings. All right, this week on the Mind Body Soil podcast, we are honored and gratefully receiving broadcasting with Joel Salatin of Polyface Farm. Um, where do I, what do I also, what else do I have to say, really? Um, what a legend. Everyone should know about Joel. If not, go check out his work. I'm looking forward to hopefully receiving your bio um, so I can rattle that off because it's one of the best bios I've, I've heard with the, um, what, what do you call yourself <laughs> again, Joel? Um, well, the, the, the Christ, Christian libertarian environmentalist, uh, capitalist, lunatic farmer. That's the one. Um, what, yeah. a, what a bloody beauty. And um, yeah, so today hoping to um, to cross a co- uh, go across a couple of topics, try and tie um, soil health into mental health and farmer health, dive into some of Joel's practices and, and how he is still able to uh, remain such a resilient and healthy character, even though he's... What what are you sixty sixty odd now, Joel? I'll be I'll be I'll be sixty six in a couple of weeks. Mate, you are not looking a day over fifty. Well done. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Tell <laughs> tell my wife. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, I like to I like to start, Joel, um, with our guests, and just to recall an impactful moment from their journey, and and sort of what what was that aha moment that really that lit the fire for you and and set you on your path to farming? Yeah, well, it would probably be two. Probably the the first one was, uh, was when I was 10 years old and got my first uh, batch of little chicks from Sears and Roebuck, uh, the Sears and Roebuck mail order uh, catalog outfit. And I got 50, 50 little chicks and had them in a box down in the basement under a, under a light bulb. And um, that was just, just magic. Uh, but the other, uh, I don't think I realized how important it was until later in life. And that was that, um, you know, we came to this farm in 1961 and it was uh, an eroded gullied rock pile. Those of you know, people have read, you know, about what I've, how I've described the farm when it was like when we came here and, uh, uh, it I mean, it was it was cheap. It was the the armpit of the community, and um, and and you know we we tried to plant vegetables in the garden, and it was just clay clods, and you know all of this. Well, my grandfather, uh, my dad's dad, lived in Indiana, and he was a very early uh, early adherent of um, Rodale's Organic Gardening and Farming magazine. He had a big compost pile, had a little flock of chickens, and and um, it was and and. and and he had this very large garden. You know, it was probably a quarter acre, which is a pretty good sized garden. And it was it was completely lined with a tea trellis uh, arbor of grapes. So these grapes are up, you know, and they're on this 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 uh, tea top. Of course, I'm a, I, and w- because we were farming, we could never go visit them until late in the summer after we'd made hay and all that stuff. So every time we'd go up there, the grapes were ripe. It was the season for grapes. And as a little kid, I would go out there and just just these these bushels and bushels of grapes that were that I could just reach as a kid, you know, up above my head. They were just oozing, oozing juice and sweetness. And and that to be and in the garden, the garden was amazing. And so here we were on this hard scrabble, hard scrabble place with dirt clods, clay, you know, all this. And I'd go up there. And, and I realized looking back now that that was that, that I just in the deep subconscious, I wanted to be able to walk out into an immersion of abundance. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I wanted at some point to be able to have a place like grandpa's uh, that was that fertile, that abundant, that, you know, soil just black, you know, down. And, um, and, and that was, that was, Again, I don't think I had all that, you know, the, the conscious part of that as a little child. But but as I grew older, I realized that that juxtaposition of our hard scrabble rock pile versus grandpa's uh, um, abundance, that that 
that gave me this desire to can I can I make our infertile hard scrabble place? Can I make that like grandpa's place? Yeah, wow, that's it's beautiful. And I guess recognizing that abundance um and that it, it is possible and seeing how it should look. Yes. Um so so how is it looking today out at out at Polyface, Joel? And and how's it how's <laughs> well, the journey been? Yeah, well, I mean, that's the that's the joy of my life, you know. Uh that that I mean, I was four. I was four when we came here, so I've been here now 62 years. And uh and I can remember as a little child walking, walking the whole farm and being able to walk and not step on grass because it was that sparse, you know. Um, and, and I remember these uh these deep gullies. Uh I remember large areas, you know, um uh maybe maybe a quarter of a hectare, you know, pretty large. And they were just like, like saucers of rocks in the fields. In fact, we had so little, little soil that when dad started with electric fencing to, to move the cows around, he poured concrete in car tires, pushed a half inch pipe down in it. And he'd pile these, these, uh, these concrete stanchions on the tractor platform. And my brother and I, you know, we were little kids, but the two of us could get on the edge of these these uh, concrete tires and heave them off as dad drove down the field. Then he'd stick the electric fence down in those half inch pipes to build electric fence. Wow. And uh, because we didn't have enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. And today, today, all of those areas have, um, I mean, I'm, I'm inches, 12 inches. So, you know, we're talking about uh, whatever, a hundred, 300 mil. Oh no. Yeah. yeah oh, three, yeah. 300. Yeah. Three, yeah. Yeah. It'd be, be 300 mil. Of, of soil on them. Now it's not, you know, it's not real deep like it was back 400 years ago, but it's, uh, but, but three, 300 mil is better than zero. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and we don't use the tires anymore. There's enough soil to hold up electric fence stakes. And uh, we, we don't, you can't see where those areas were unless we get into a real severe drought. And then obviously they, you know, they get drier, they get drier faster, but otherwise, you know, uh, people don't even realize I know what's under there, but most people wouldn't know what's under there. So, so how is that possible, Joe? I mean, uh, according to, I mean, modern day science and a, a lot of scientific scientific literature, it takes a thousand years to to build an inch, isn't it, of, of topsoil? So, how have you accelerated that that process and um and and mm -hmm. built back that soil? Yeah. Sure. So it's a combination of things. It's not just one thing, you know, it's uh, this, this soil building thing is kind of a recipe. And so, uh, so obviously the first thing we did was we, we didn't plow, you know, we, we let it go to, we let it go to perennials. And then we started, we started the, the controlled grazing and it was, it, you know, early on in the sixties, um, you know, before, uh, before uh, uh, Gallagher and, uh, and speed ride and you know all the the big electric fence companies were operating uh, we we were it was very primitive you know with steel wire and a little you know energizer that was that that was powered by the the um nice. oh the points and condensers out of an automobile you know that's what that's what pulsed the uh that's what pulsed the energizer anyway um you know we started moving the cows around and uh that was that was a game changer you know because that that allowed what was there to you know to grow up better and um and then then we we built a shade mobile so we could we could move that with the cows and put the and put the manure right where we wanted it instead of where the cows wanted it we could place that manure and that was that was instrumental in um in allowing us to concentrate as a strategy to be able to concentrate the pasture droppings where we wanted them and not lose them in a creek or under a tree or something like that. So that was critical. And then we started with the chickens and the, the chickens, uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, chickens now, now let, let's agree. So we're importing grain. We're imp I, I get it. Okay. We're importing grain for the chickens, but we're importing grain from places downstream that are in lowland, you know, that, that probably has some of the soil that washed off our place, yeah. you know, back uh, years ago. And, and so, uh, so the chickens start running on it. And then the final uh, thing that the, 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 a, a big game changer, a really accelerator was when we started toward composting and we started doing composting in a, in a big way uh, uh, back as early as whatever, 19, I don't know, I was maybe 14 or 15 when we went and bought our first wood chipper 
Uh, so this would have been the early, early 70s. And we bought a wood chipper and began chipping, chipping tree branches and things, composting that and putting that out on the field. And so the combination of, of perennials, controlled grazing, multi-speciation, concentrated pasture droppings, and compost, those kind of four elements um, allowed us to, you know, to, to stimulate to stimulate the soil development, you know, faster, faster than it would under just normal conditions. Absolutely. And like you say, I love that you said it wasn't just one answer because I think a lot of the time nowadays we're looking for that silver bullet, but uh, it, it always is a, um, you know, a device, a diverse range of things. So, um, so thank yes. you for touching on that. And, and back in those days, Joel, I mean, who inspired you to, I mean, to start moving the animals like that? Were there any influential figures, figures around? I mean, we had voice yeah. and, and folk like that. Um, sure. Uh, my, my dad, my dad, um, got a hold of some voicing stuff early, uh, very early. And, um, and you know, that is still, you know, grass productivity, uh, voicing that's still kind of the, you know, the Bible of the, you know, of this, of uh, this, uh, grazing management movement. And, um, so, you know, I, you know, I didn't develop this dad, dad got it from, uh, from Voisin and, you know, uh, Voisin was just kind of hitting the world. It, his research was done in France in the, in the late forties and early fifties. So when we came here in 61, um, he was just, you know, he was just hitting on the world stage is what I'm getting at. You know, he was, he was right. He was, he was more popular then than he was through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Now people are rediscovering him, but uh, but at, at that time he was he, he had he had a lot to offer, and so Dad got a hold of this. It certainly made sense because it it does make sense, and uh, um, and and that's that's how we started uh, uh, grazing. Our problem was, and, and you know, so people ask me, well do you think you could have accelerated it? Well, yeah, if, if we knew then, and, and if we had the infrastructure now, you know, computer microchip energizers and, and poly braid and, 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 you know, these kind of things, if we had had all that then that we have today, I'm confident we could have, we could have gotten where we've gone in, in a third of the time. Uh, and now, you know, we lease, we lease several properties in the area and um, it's so fun to go on these places and, Every year, it doesn't matter if it's a good year, bad year, whatever. Every year when we go on in the first year, we double their production, double it. Oh, yeah. And so, so um, uh, you know, we, we know what can be done. And uh, yeah, yeah, dad was heavily influenced by Voisin. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's, that's incredible. And, you know, back in those days, we didn't also have the internet. I mean, that's quite a, a big right. change, you know, so to, for Voisin to get his message out, I mean, um, what a feat. Yeah. So it was obviously made yeah. sense. Well, I mean, people, people, yeah. Well, well, people were buying books back then. You can see what's behind me, you know, and uh, I'm a book guy. Okay. And, uh, and, and so people were buying books. In fact, uh, when Ed Faulkner, when Ed Faulkner wrote Plowman's Folly in, I think it was 1950, 1951, uh, when he wrote Plowman's Folly and started, um, started questioning the val questioning the moldboard plow. Mm -hmm. And um, and when he did that, think about this: a book by the by the title "Plowman's Folly" sold five hundred thousand copies in six months. Wow. It was it was a runaway bestseller. Um, but but of course, at that time, America, the U.S., you know, had had uh, ten times as many farmers as we have today. So that you know, the, the client base was was quite large. But but imagine a book of that title selling five hundred. I mean, you couldn't sell that many in the whole world today, you know, uh, of that of that title. And so, uh, so yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing some of the power that that some of these books had at that at that time. Absolutely. Do you think a um a relevant title maybe for the twenty first century would be something like Industrial Agriculture's Folly or something? I mean, I'm sure. You, you're probably better at titling books than me. I mean, you've written a couple. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Cer cer certainly, that has you know that has uh, run its course. And I mean, um, my 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 book that that is that 
that deals with the follies of the whole uh, current conventional agriculture mindset is the sheer ecstasy of being a lunatic farmer. And um, I, 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 call, I call that my soul book. You know, when people come up and say, oh, come on, farming's farming, cows are cows, you know, corn is corn, doesn't matter what you do. I, 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 I said, this book was written for you because this, this contrasts, it contrasts the conventional ortho, the chemical conventional orthodoxy today with a, with a biological carbon-based approach. And it's, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of satire and humor in it. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a fun book. Fantastic. And um, I think that's that's all part of it, you know, and probably one of the most important parts of it. We take things too seriously, don't we, you know? And, yeah. Um, and I've noticed that about your work, and I, I love that about you, is, and it's infectious, that you, you're just happy, you know, and, and it it, mm-hmm. it um, bleeds through all your work. And I, I and that's really what I want to try and dive into and drill into a bit today is, is how do you cultivate that and... Um, you know, because you're obviously so busy too. I mean, farmers struggle a lot with burnout. Like you said, it's it's hard to get off the farm to even go see your grandpa um, back in the right. day when you're so busy. And that's mm-hmm. often an excuse we hear is you're so busy to even make a change. Um, right. So, so what okay. are some of the, the habits or um, techniques or whatever you want to call it that, it that you think help you to establish that, that mindset, that peace of mind, that happiness? Um, yeah, well, I think, I think the uh, the the main thing is to have a a sacred righteous mission and know what it is. You know, Alan Savory, of course. You know, Alan Savory is is just wonderful. Certainly one of my uh, mentors. And if 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 you boiled what Alan Savory has done down to one thing, one thing in my view, it is the mission statement. Because uh, um, a mission statement is our why. It, it's it's our why. And you know Simon Sinek has written a lot about this. In fact, he has a book. You know, sell the why. And, and um, you know, all of us know all of us know what we do. Some people know how we do it, but very p- few people can articulate why. And I think that the mission statement gets us to a why. So um, so you know our mission statement here is to develop environmentally, emotionally, and economically enhancing agricultural prototypes and facilitate their duplication throughout the world. Very simple, very concise, but that's a, but anybody hearing that is struck by, well, that's big. That's, that's a big mission. And, and I've heard it said that if you're, if your mission can be accomplished in a lifetime it's too small you, you need a mission that you need a mission that's bigger than you that touches life bigger than you and uh, and, and so for me uh, you know what what drives me is that clarity of mission and then I would say the gratitude of knowing you mean I get to go out and and touch this this womb, this ecological umbilical. I get to touch it. Uh, talk about. I mean, that's both a privilege and a, and a big responsibility. But to be able to go out and just and just jump in off the back porch and immerse in this this abundance, and and as a caretaker of this that's so bigger than me, um, is a is a wonderful thing and I, I i think i think too often uh too often farmers see themselves as well i've got to feed the world or i've got to you know as some sort of obligatory thing and and of course the you know the agriculture experts push this they push this agenda you farmers you know, you better do this that or or, or, or they're going to starve in sri lanka you know they're going to uh and, and, and so these farmers walk around with this big you know burden on their back uh that, that's that's an incredible it's a it's an incredible um um hindrance isn't it yeah yeah it is it's a well it, yeah yeah it's it's a it's a weight it, it's a weight on their shoulders uh and, and so one of the one of the first things that i like to do when i talk to farmers is is um you know what you're not responsible for the children dying in bangladesh you're not responsible for the kids that are suffering in in kenya 
nobody in the world is starving because there's not enough food. Uh, what you're responsible for, number one, you're responsible for your earthworms. You're responsible for the you're responsible for the for the sunbeams that are hitting your farm. Are they are they being converted to biomass? Or is a leaf catching those sunbeams uh, when a raindrop falls? Is the raindrop um, hitting a hitting a blade of grass so it so it shatters into a mist and comes onto the ground like a like a gentle mist? Or is it pounding on hard rock like a bunch of bombs being dropped by you know uh, fighter jets? Um, you know those those are the things. If you if you can get out. If you can get out from under this 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 uh, political this political obligatory burden, and just see for a moment the 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 privilege, the responsibility, and the opportunity of of caressing caressing our ecological womb as if it's if it's as if it's a lover. You know, we're, farmers are told all the time that nature is a Nature is a hard partner. You know, there's grasshoppers and there's drought and there's hot and there's cold and, there's, arr, 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 you know, and and so we have to subdue nature like some sort of a, a reluctant, a reluctant partner. And I'm going to get you. I'm going to make you do this. Arr, 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 you know, yeah, yeah. we're actually, 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 nature is a benevolent lover that just wants to be caressed in the right places. Yeah. Uh, no, Joe, that's. Stunning. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and and you, you're too right that it's not just the farmers that are that are sucked into all this as well. You know, it's it's a, a the world we live in is now all the world's problems are everyone else's. You know, like the media is very good at doing that. So um, it's and so once you start ramping on again more weight on onto these farmers' backs with debt right. and pressure and um, you know, family. All sorts of yep. all sorts of other stuff. I mean, it's a, it is a hard craft, but as you say, if you can tap into that rewarding side of it and be grateful um, that we get to be a part of it, I mean, that's unbelievable. Well, when you yeah, when you uh, David, when you have when you have something like, for example, the war in uh, the war in uh, in Ukraine, mm. and I, I'm sure you're hearing in Australia as well the the escalating price of fertilizer. Uh, from you know because Russia makes all this chemical fertilizer and sells it all over the world and and so here in the U.S. I think I think a lot of the chemical fertilizer prices have jumped uh, 300 to 400 percent you know in the last 12 months and 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 so so when you, when you couple when you couple that kind of of um, that kind of effect in your life that there, there's nothing a farmer can do about that you know. I, I can't I can't change that at all. Now at our farm, we just laugh and realize, well, we don't buy any of it, so it doesn't make any difference to us. But 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 to the average farmer, who is completely dependent on something outside his control, but he's still obligated to produce the wheat or the corn or the the chicken or whatever it is for the starving kids in Bangladesh, um, and that and that burden is still there. The the um, you know the requirement is still there. But but his costs and his his um, you know his business plan is completely outside his control. It it, it becomes it becomes an emotional nightmare. Absolutely, yeah, and and continually fluctuating yes. too because you're like you right. say it's all out of your control. Um, so right. in your experience, then Joel, are you seeing uh, farmers that make this shift towards this more ecological approach? Are they they're generally happier in your experience and they i imagine in a lot of cases it would transform them oh absolutely it does and it's but it's um it's actually it's actually quite hard uh certainly people do it but it's actually quite hard to uh to make the transition um especially if you're big uh the bigger you are the harder it is to turn the ship but uh so there, there is an advantage in being and uh, being a little bit smaller, you know, if you're going to make those changes. But uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, when people come out and 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 so suddenly now I realize, well, I'm just depending on the water, the sun, you know, and 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 yes, uh, they 
I, I can't control the water and the sun. I get that. But they're not controlled by politics either. They're not controlled by by some you know crazy guy somewhere. The board of directors, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Board of directors, right? Uh, 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 stockholders, shareholders. Uh, the, 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 it, 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 it's it's something else. And in and in the in the biggest in the biggest scheme of things, all of that is 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 a benevolent provision, whatever it is. Whatever it is, it's a benevolent provision. It's not. It's not subject to the whims of of politics and wars and and, and people. And and so yes, I am dependent on on uh, uh, you know on sun and water. I am dependent on that. But there's a difference being dependent on something that's out of my control. That's that's out of humanity's control versus just out of my control because somebody else controls it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Something that, that that someone can flick a switch and it turns, you know. Yes. What I mean? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I mean that's been going on for from the the dawn of time. You know, right. Relying on the sun to rise. I mean that's part of being yeah. human, isn't it? Um, yes, that's right. And and that harks to something that I heard you say, and and I, I think it must be one of your most recent podcasts. But um, and I'll paraphrase a little bit, and you can you can fix it up for me a bit, but, um, so the way that we have traded our convenience, um, uh, sorry, mm. we've traded work, um, and, you know, labor and et cetera for convenience and how that has actually made us unhappier and less resilient. And, um, yes. yeah, I, I just, that's yeah. just so profound to me. And it, it's, it's a beautiful statement because it, it it's across the board. It's not just farming. It's, yes. It's everyone. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think I think uh, uh, where I where I went with that was I was talking about uh, participation and we have uh, for for decades now, at least in our, you know, sophisticated Western, you know, mindset, uh, we, we have kind of marginalized, if not demonized, um, participating in the foundations of life uh, like growing growing food uh boards you know the things that give people you know calluses and splinters on their hands um the the, the culture has kind of has kind of pushed that into well that's um that's marginal work you know that that's that's blue collar unsophisticated you know uh um uh dumb people do that smart people don't do that and, and and that's kind of been the you know the the mindset of the culture and and, and the whole the whole thing has been predicated on uh you don't have to participate in that don't worry the multinational food conglomerates you know they'll they'll put they'll put it on your table and it'll be convenient and that'll give you more time to keep up with the kardashians and the football league and and uh the latest movie and be able to go to the fashion fashion show and blah 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 right and so we we've been we've been kind of we've been kind of uh, preached this sermon now for quite some time, um, as if as if freedom came from not participating in the humdrum work of foundational existence. Well, here we are suddenly post COVID, and there's this big epiphany now. People are realizing, wow, the folks who continued to participate, who planted gardens, butchered cows, made bologna, <laughs> you know, cut lumber. The, the people that continue to participate in those foundational aspects of life, like, like we call it chores, the people who chose to participate, they are the ones that are freed. You know, on our farm, we chose to participate in the carbon cycle. So... So we were not we were not freed from the carbon cycle by just buy the chemical fertilizer and you don't have to compost and you don't have to worry about this carbon cycle. Well, we opted to participate in the carbon cycle, realizing how important it was. And now suddenly, guess who is free? We're free from Vladimir Putin. We're free from Ukraine. We're free from the multinational corporations. And so the the the, the point is that the more you participate, that, that we were sold a bill of goods. 
we were told that that you get you get freedom you get freedom by by letting somebody else do all that actually the opposite is true true freedom comes by actively participating in these fundamentals of of life absolutely and that's what makes us uh, human you know and um i mean it it sort of ties back to the to the why again and and this quest for meaning and fulfillment um and i think a lot of that with this the trade off has been you know we're a lot of us are stripped of meaning and um, we don't really have a compass of, of where to go or, or how we can engage and how we can participate in a meaningful existence anymore. You know, that's, that's sort of being taken away a little bit at a time. I mean, now we've got, I mean, even this rise of AI thing. And, and I think a couple of years ago, you even mentioned this, um, the dehumanization of, you know, even with the mask wearing and um, yeah. we can't see people smiling. And now with AI writing everyone's work and, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it is. It does feel increasingly like there is a push for dehumanization, um, and I'm interested. Yeah. There, yeah. There. There. Yeah. There again. There again. We're being told you don't have to write. Just let the machine write. Yeah. Well, I guarantee you. I guarantee you that at some point, at some point, there will be a there will be a um, a black swan. There will be a black swan that arises to realize, oh. Maybe, maybe we should have. Maybe we should have continued to participate. Maybe we shouldn't have just given all that over to to uh, to some other you know other uh, AI entity. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, I, I think I think that this lesson is just a really powerful and profound lesson because because you know what are you free to do? I mean, you may not know this, but in the U.S. right now, the latest um, whatever uh, surveys show that in in the US right now males so men between 25 and 35 years old the average american male 25 to 35 years old spends 20 hours a week playing video games 20 hours a week that's average that's average playing video games so so what does this what does this convenience this lack of participation what does it do um it actually turns you into a zombie. Uh, you know, you, you, just think if those if those average twenty hours a week could be were were put to learning how to repair an engine, uh, install plumbing, um, weld, uh, plant a garden, can can you know a lacto ferment? I, I mean, uh, you know, uh, this goes on, uh, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. The list goes on. All all these lost all these lost uh, craft skills. Yeah. That's, that's unbelievable. I was not aware of that, of that statistic. And that is terrifying. And I imagine even as you go lower with the ages, I mean, it's probably higher, just even the amount Mm -hmm. of screen time. Um, Sure. There was a study actually that I think that came out of Australia that was something like kids spend, you know, I think it's like one or two hours outside to every six or seven hours they have on a screen. And yeah, um, that's right. It's just terrifying. Uh, It is a terrifying statistic. And, then we wonder why we're disconnected from nature, why we're miserable, why we have lack of purpose. I mean, go figure. <laughs> yeah, and and why we why we don't even have an immune system. Oh, wow. You know, uh, fin- Finland Finland has done probably the world's greatest work on tying the the human microbiome and, and the overall immunity system to our connection with soil and uh and and even even a farm you know they've, they've done all these studies with like urban kids compared to kids that that you know are out in the in the dairy barn uh in their stroller you know and they're yeah. probably you know picking up a little bit of manure and putting it in their mouth and things like that as little infants yeah. and and what they found is that the the immunological the the, the immune function yeah. uh in those kids is just is is off the charts uh, uh, with the you know with the farm kids versus the city kids, so much so that they've actually proposed uh, or, or actually posited what if we what if we could somehow bring farm soil into the city to like you know uh, powder powder people's noses you know <laughs> with, with with farm soil just just to bring um, just to bring that into contact with people to feed their their microbiome 
and um, and so you know, I, I thought here in the U.S., what I need to do is start. I need to start a, a new business where you, know, you got your welcome mat, you know, at your house. Welcome mat. Well, we need we need to make a, a, a permeable one. You know, a, a, it's like a, a thin bladder. You know, we can stuff a bunch of compost and soil in there, and. And, and, and we'll, we'll sell subscriptions to city people that can subscribe to our service. And we'll every quarter we'll come and we'll dump out the old and put in new, so they can stomp on it and you know and and, and wall it around in it. And uh, and they'll get our they'll get our farm microbes in their city house, and they'll actually be healthier. Well, you have your first customer right here, Joel. I'll sign up. <laughs> okay. That that's freaking awesome. I love that. And and thanks for taking it um, this direction because. I mean, this is the cutting edge of science, you know, I, I mean, yeah. with all the developments that have happened in the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years with the microbiome and, and soil, I mean, it's, yes. it's fascinating. And, and who's to say, well, I mean, I mean the, the conversation around the immune system is incredibly important at this time. I mean, people mm. need to rebuild their immune systems and need all the tools available to start introducing some diversity and um, things into their lives. And I'd love to just tap into your uh, your methods of, of how you, I mean, you're naturally with the work that you do, you're you're being inoculated every day, right? Um, but yeah, take- but I I I, <laughs> I I I inoculate on steroids. Um, uh, I those the people who know me know that I routinely drink out of the out of the water tank with the cows, yeah. and I know you know the cows are on this side, I'm on this side. And uh, I drink, I mean, there might be some cow snot and, you know, some, some drop blades of grass in there, but, but uh, I, I just get right down there like a cow and drink out of the a cow tank. And I've been doing that for years. And I, I honestly believe that, that, um, you know, that, that, that really helps, you know, I don't use antimicrobial soap. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I was just out uh, and stoked the, you know, it's cold here. We're in the winter. So I just stoked the, uh, the wood stove out there. And uh, came in to eat supper, and I purposely didn't wash my hands with soap. I I, I cleaned I cleaned the the basic stuff off with just water, but I'm still I'm sure I've still got some you know some wood wood stuff in there. You know, might have some some termites or whatever, uh, termite poo, whatever you know. And and I mean this this is uh, I mean I'm not talking about just being filthy, but but I am saying we we need to understand the the, the two things that are that are uh, both paramount and identical in the microbiome is diversity. How many, how much diversity is in your microbiome? You know, as they study everything from autism to, to um, Alzheimer's and different things, they're finding, they're finding that the gut, the microbes, the microbes in the gut are absolutely, uh, you can, you can measure them, uh, with fecal samples, and, and th- there are these patterns of of missing whole missing species of microbes. If you have this disease, that disease, or the other disease, and and so so the complexity. Here's where I'm going with this: the complexity of the microbiome is the is the secret to health. Just like the complexity of the soil is the secret to soil health. But what have we done ever since 1837 when Justice von Liebig, the Austrian biochemist, told us that all of life is just a rearrangement of nitrogen, potassium, and and phosphorus, and all we have to do is give the soil nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, and everything will be fine. That, That was the ultimate simplification, simplification of the soil complexity. And we have been worshiping at that altar Ever since 1837, as a as a as a as a result, our soils have become more simplified. Our crops have become, in other words, all of the all of the complex nuances from from uh, essential oils, fatty acids, the the enzymes, uh, the the mineral balances, all those things have become simplified, and so here we are now. Now with an incredibly simplified microbiome, and we've we've got a health crisis. Uh, we've got all sorts of new diseases. The the life expectancy is going down instead of up, and um, and 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 we have simplified. Yeah, you know we've taken that we've taken that think about it, we've taken that complex uh, chicken 
that's supposed to eat some bugs and worms and grass and, and some corn. And, and we've taken that complexity. We, we lock her in a house and we feed her nothing but corn and soybeans and a little bit of wheat. And, and we have simplified the egg. We, you know, uh, we have one of the, one of the fastest ways to create more complexity in your microbiome is to eat eggs, poultry, and meat from animals that are on a diversified pasture where they're getting all sorts of different uh, sorts of different plants that concentrate different minerals and different different uh, enzymes and things. Uh, and and so the the simplification um, is showing up now in our depleted microbiome that's lacking its complexity and it goes all the way back to Justice von Liebig in 1837 who told us that all all we are is just NPK and and the same the same model is now being adopted into human health obviously with that decline we all buy our supplements now with a sure. you know the individual elements that we need instead right. of like you say eating these uh, these correctly raised and produced animals um, yes it's it's fascinating and and even to the point where you're talking about shipping soil into the city i mean we send a lot of food into the cities from farms right but it's not right it doesn't it's sterile a lot of it and it's a lot of it yeah. doesn't have those essential amino acids that that we require so um mm -hmm. you know, i'd love to just highlight now uh the the difference between these commodity crops and the way that we produce food with that free element approach um and then food that it, that comes from these complex systems and and not just food i think it's really important to highlight here that i mean food we got fiber as well it, it ob obviously produces a superior uh, fiber um and and also medicines i mean uh in, in america you have the the whole um industrial cannabis complex or whatever but which i fear is has, has steered away from what could have been a, a really um, healthy movement that was embracing complexity again and has been uptaken by again the big players and the sure. opportunity to sell yeah. more chemicals and produce again sure. a, a substance that is not what it should be um so yeah in interested to hear your thoughts on this and then maybe you can explain a, a little bit about um the sure difference. yeah sure so yeah yeah so you've got uh you've got hydro hydroponic cannabis <laughs> Yeah, crazy. Uh, so yeah, so so the the differences are the differences are pretty um, pretty amazing, and of course they 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 show up in taste. Uh, you can tell you can tell a lot about taste. I mean, one of the one of the reasons kids don't like vegetables is because they're so bland now. They don't have the 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 popping flavor that comes with a full spectrum of mineral and uh, and um, enzymatic uh, balance yeah. so we uh you know we actually participated in a test uh, where it, here in the u.s where they asked um uh 12 of us in the country that did pastured eggs for example to send them to a lab to get you know um nutrient testing i think they tested 12 nutrients i'll just take one folic acid folic acid is really really important for pregnant women um but it, it's just an essential it's an essential fatty acid and um and so the official the official uh, us department of agriculture um uh you know uh, nutrient analysis you know uh, the, is on the egg carton you know when they put the the nutrient labeling on there um the egg has uh, according to the usda has 48 48 micrograms of folic acid per egg and uh, and so ours ours averaged um our, our average 1038 micrograms per egg so you know this is these, these are not little 10 percent variations these, these are multiplicative values of of, of difference um you know uh, uh, it, like in beef uh, grass finished beef has three uh three times or 300 percent more riboflavin than grain finished beef uh, conjugated linoleic acid. Conjugated linoleic acid is what is what gives the um, the elasticity on the synapses at your nerve endings. It, it, it keeps those those uh, uh, nerve endings 
real supple mm -hmm. and um and, and it only takes about two to three weeks of grain feeding to chase all the conjugated linoleic acid out of the body of an herbivore wow. And, wow. and and so you know you can just go on and on and on and on with this the 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 um you know the the differences are are astounding and um and so you know people need to understand that when they talk about the price of when we have a cheap food policy if you have a cheap food policy you're going to have a cheap nutrient policy if you have a cheap nutrient policy you're going to have a a poor nutrition policy and a poor nutrition policy is going to put you into an expensive health policy <laughs> so you know uh, i would i would rather see and i would rather see a um a, a a fair price a fair price food policy and see and see a uh, a cheap health policy I, i'd rather see that kind of uh, that kind of inversion absolutely it would be a beautiful world wouldn't it and um yes it would and i don't think I don't think we're that far away, Joe. I mean, it's like you said, this black swan event and probably one of many to come. Who knows what is on the horizon? Sure. I mean, that's one of the very exciting things, I guess, about living through this. And I'm sure um, yeah. it must just be wild for you because you have so much more experience. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, no one knows what's going to happen from day to day. So, I, I've, right. again, I see the importance of, of what you mentioned before about relying on the sun and the and the water instead of all this other craziness because it it allows you to not get sucked into it and and you can find that that um that peaceful the peace i guess um otherwise shit's crazy <laughs> yeah um, yeah yeah so, you're exactly right. yeah i just wonder you know what's next and um and what we in terms of policy i mean what what would you do in terms of how do we flip that on its head and and install something like a a um cheap health policy and a, a fair <laughs> price food uh, system yeah well the, the 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 most important thing we could do to get there is just to get the government out of agriculture and health care mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you know um i i i, I know that uh, australians are not nearly as libertarian as americans but uh um i, I i'm pretty libertarian and and what what the 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 problem with the government in with the government um uh, involvement in these things, whether it's agriculture, healthcare, or whatever, Th the problem is that what you have then is a is an official. Uh, they pick official winners, and so when official winners get arbitrarily picked, you know, Adam Smith in the Wealth of Nations wrote about the invisible hand of the market. The invisible hand of the market, you know, moves things, and and so. Um, you know, I mean, just just to just think a minute about how how information about DDT, for example, DDT, DDT um, came out of use long before the government banned it, long before. Uh, and, and so, and so, what happens is that when you have policy, and you get and you get the the public largesse, all the taxpayers' money, uh, and 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 funny money that's just printed out of thin air. Uh, when you get all that, and you start throwing it at certain things, they will never be truly innovative things, because they will only be things that satisfy the powers that be. The, um, and so it's, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking here today, today it was just announced that the U.S. the U.S. has agreed to sell, uh, what, 20, uh, 20 F-16 fighter jets to Turkey. Well, here we are. Here we are sending billions of dollars to uh, to Ukraine. And, and, and the, the biggest the biggest problem Ukraine has is these um, are these uh, Turkish and Iranian made uh, drones that come into Ukraine. And, and so we're sending over billions of dollars to help them. And then we send a bunch of fighters to Turkey. It, it, it's just, it's just, it's just nuts. It's just nuts. And so, um, so what I would like to see is I would simply like to see the, the marketplace be responsible for where we go. Now, a lot of people say, well, well, you know, the average person isn't going to, well, wait, wait a minute. Right now, the average person gets hit every day by all sorts of, of uh of narrative by 
intellectual government accredited people that 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 plant a narrative yes. and if if i could just go head to head with monsanto for example if i could just go head to head with monsanto i think i would win that argument but i'm not going head to head with monsanto i'm going head to head with monsanto and the us department of agriculture and the food and drug administration and the land grant universities and the and the American Medical Association, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a stacked, um, it's a pretty stacked deck. And so, uh, so what I would like to see is I would like to see a, a defunding, if we're going to defund something, let's defund, uh, defund the manipulation of, of the public largesse to pick winners and losers and let the marketplace um let the marketplace respond i mean people people desperately want uh better food but a lot of time but you know the, the government uh food regulations the um you know the food safety uh people make it so difficult for a new player to enter it uh if you want to make a, a chicken pot pie or you want to butcher a beef or something like that you know um in Australia, it's uh, it's food. What is it? Food Safe, I think, is the is the regulatory um, uh, body there, yeah. and and to to pass the regulations to be able to enter the marketplace, actually precludes many innovative, entrepreneurial, um, higher quality people from being able to enter the marketplace. It's uh, you're too right, and and for someone, for a young fella like me that would love to get into farming, or I'm sure there's plenty of other young crew out there that want to have a crack at this. It it makes it really challenging um, to get that start, you know, and that's why I love your work too because you have you have the recipes of how we can make a start, you know, with little capital, with where you're at. Right. Um, so so I love that. That's really empowering. But like you say, and then you have all this overarching bureaucrats or whatever that sort of push you out of the game i mean for us um we've just started farming um maybe in the last eight months um really small scale um but you know to then scale things up and to enter into the registering all your chickens registering your beehives blah 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 growing your yep. mushroom growing mushrooms that you know you need licenses and if you were to engage in all of the things they want you to do it makes it very challenging um and expensive yeah. so like you said yeah they're, the, they're pushing the small guy out yeah the the, the regulations the, the thing that people need to understand is that the regulations are scale prejudicial mm -hmm. they're scale prejudice in other words they're much easier to comply with and and acquire if you're big than if you're small i mean if you need a if you need a a a uh to grow mushrooms, for example, uh, or or to you know to be able to sell your mushrooms, that that's nothing if you're if you're an established business selling tractor trailer loads of mushrooms. But if you're just if you're just wanting to to start and uh, you know kind of play around a little bit and uh, let's let's see what works here, uh, that license fee just prohibited you from being able to enter the the marketplace because because you might not sell more than a couple hundred dollars worth in a whole year and and so that 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 license uh just kept you uh locked you out of the marketplace and so I, I, look I'm, I'm not an anarchist i'm not an anarchist but i i do believe i do believe that at some point there needs to be a way for voluntary consenting adults to exercise freedom of choice about what to feed their microbiome and 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 un, unless and until we allow people to actually take take charge of their own microbiome and not be dependent on some bureaucrat uh that says yeah that's okay and that's not okay um we're not going to have that kind of personal autonomy which is you know it's you know who owns me? I mean, that's you know that's the question. Uh, who owns me? And and if if we don't have the capacity to to, to decide the fuel for our own microbiome, uh, 
you know, what's next? I mean, we, we tell the government, get out of my bedroom, get out of my marriage, get out of my womb, you know, all these things, but we don't tell the government to get out of our mouth. Yeah. Yeah. And far out. That's, that's huge. And I, I love the way you phrase that. That's, um, it's important in this day and age. <laughs> um, sure. And, yeah. and damn right. We, uh, we have, that's our fundamental human right, you know, that, that freedom of choice. Sure. And, um, and it's influenced across the board in, in every, like you say, with those, that messaging and narrative, um, it's hard to make a decision or to become educated a lot of the time because there's so many opposing arguments and, and that's very deliberate, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, well, you know, I, I would say you know, if there's somebody listening that says, why, goodness, my, uh, we, we've got to have somebody, you know, signing off on this food is safe. Well, what if, you know, uh, I mean, one of the last times I testified down in uh, in our state capital on a, on a cottage food bill, um, the head of the meat and poultry inspection pulled me aside uh, during a break. He said, Joel, he said, we can't. We can't let people d uh, choose their own food. Why? We couldn't build hospitals fast enough for all the people that would get, you know, bad food from bad farmers and all this stuff. And and um, not well. The, the problem is uh, that I can't. I can't prove to him that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. I don't think. I think he's wrong. I don't think that's true. But but the problem is with the with the licensing the way it is. We can't even experiment to see what freedom of choice would do. Uh, you know, we, why can't the federal government say if a locality wants to, wants to within their own borders, offer an unregulated food transaction uh, uh, ability, and we'll just, we'll experiment, we'll see. A bunch of people get sick, maybe that's not a good idea. But what if, what if really good food prices came down, uh, farmers were able to make a living easier, and we had happy farmers, and we had healthy people, and you know what? What if that happened? And so, one of our problems right now is we don't even have the freedom to experiment because of all the licensing and the compliance. We don't even have the ability to experiment on innovative uh, solutions, yes. and that's a that that's a that's a shame. It's dangerous. It's really dangerous. sure it's dangerous. Yeah. Sure, it's dangerous. And, 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 you know, I'm not talking about dismantling uh, food safe. You know, if, if you're scared and you want and you want a, a federal government inspector to check all of your own food, well, go to Woolies. You know, that's what it's there for. All right. Totally. But but for, for yeah. but for people, for people who want to opt out, mm -hmm. for people who want to opt out, there ought to be a way for a farmer and an opt out consumer to get together. And, and 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 interact in um, in transaction you know the problem is you know you, you can you can give away raw milk you can give away home butchered beef you can give away homemade butter but as soon as you sell it you're a criminal well what is it about exchanging money that suddenly turned it from a, a benevolent gift to a hazardous substance doesn't make any sense it doesn't it's backwards and um and just to clarify I wasn't saying that this idea is dangerous. I was saying that the way the system is set up is dangerous. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's right. Yeah. So yeah. for people that are well, my are... Uh, my 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 ideas are dangerous to the system. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need more. We need more Joel Salatins. We do. Um, yeah. That's there's so much there that that I'd love to go into, and and um, it's it's beautiful and. Uh, it, it's a good idea, I think, to just, to just to briefly touch on hidden costs. And I know you, you touch on it so well. Um, but, you know, what is more dangerous, uh, I think, is this, like you're saying, having our food dictated of, of what we can eat, what we can't, how it's produced. Um, I mean, even as a producer, I mean, if you want to enter in a, into a commodity market, it's it's quite difficult. Um, you have to, to, to then go outside the norm, right, and to try different things. There's little room for experimentation even all the way down to the way the food is produced. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah, if, if you're, if you're going to, if you're going to raise, for example, if you're going to raise chickens uh, for a commodity, you know, for the commodity program or pigs or, or whatever um, the, the pro the protocols are pretty, are pretty specific. Uh, you know, if you want to use a, a, a probiotic instead of an antibiotic, or if you want to use, uh, you know, vinegar instead of uh, instead of antimicrobial, you know, chlorine, 
you know, that, that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. So the, you know, the, the, the system, the system is, is highly, is highly regimented. And, but we, we all, we all know that the, the, the breakthroughs, the answers to the world's problems always come from the lunatic fringe. They come from the, the, the innovators are all around the, the lunatic fringe by definition. Uh, you know, the, 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 the status quo, um, the powers that be are always about maintaining their own power. And, uh, you know, people ask me, boy, what, what if, what if what you did became normal? I said, and, and my answer is my lands. If, if, if what we did became uh, average, it would completely invert the power position, prestige and profits of the entire agricultural and food sector. And that's a big ship to turn around. And so that's one reason why there's so much uh, inertia. There's so much inertia there to make sure that ship continues to float and go the direction it's going. Absolutely. Yeah. And not just, not just the agricultural, but pharmaceutical complex that are sure. that are like this now. Right. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. And just to unpack that a bit more, Joel. Um, so if people were then having that freedom of choice to eat, food that is responsibly produced um then they're going to be healthier i mean like you said uh, i'd like to see or to have the ability to experiment um but i mean the experiments are happening as well all you have to do is uh once you find your farmer i mean and you start eating that food and then you go and eat something from woolies it it's not the same um yeah, my my wife it. she she never used to eat meat. And then I said, I started saying, well, try some of this, try some of this from a regenerative farm. And, and um, now she won't eat the lamb from Woolies, but she loves the lamb from, from a regenerative farm. You know, it's that instinctual um, right. taste response. Like you, you mentioned earlier, I think, and yes. it leads us, it, it guides us to, to eat more of what is good for us. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Your, your body, your, your body knows, you know, it, it knows what it needs. We had a, we had a little boy in here a couple of years ago. He was, uh, I think, six or seven years old. Very, very small. His mother was very worried about him. She said he, he's just such a picky eater. He just, he just won't eat anything. And she, she'd had him to the doctor and all sorts of things. He just w was extremely, extremely small, and she was quite worried. And uh, she bought a couple dozen eggs, and um, and uh, I, I said, try those, try those with him. And she called me back a couple of weeks later, and this little six-year-old, she said. I can't fill him up. He's eating six eggs at a time. And, and, and what it was his he was, he was starved for nutrition. His, his body was starved for nutrition. And when he got some good nutrition, it, 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 it came alive. And so, you know, those things happen. I had a, had a neighbor, had a neighbor that had sheep, uh, a flock of, I don't know, two or 300 sheep. And, um, and they got through the fence one day and we, we, we feed our cows, um, uh, seaweed, uh, dehydrated seaweed as a, as a mineral, yeah. um, kelp. It, it's it's kelp from Iceland, and um, and and so we you know we give it to them all the time. And I actually I actually drove in the drove in the lane and I, I could see something. It was a like a a, a three meter tall uh, white pillar out in the field. So what in the world is that? I parked the car. I ran out there, and it was this neighbor sheep on our mineral box they were like maggots on a carcass they were they were three meters high stacked up in a big tower trying to get this mineral they were starved for mineral and uh and, and you know we just see that we, we see that all the time and we're all starving aren't we uh, in that sense and this that's what this food system has created and to to just uh, tie it back to where we where we've just come from it's um what is the dangerous which which, which 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 is one of the reasons why what you're doing is so important because you know what we're also starving for we're starving for truth mm. and we're starving for truth and, and and when people hear truth it resonates way down in here uh and and and, and you know congratulations to you for for putting this kind of material out because because I'm I guarantee you there are people that are listening who who are confused. They're they're hearing, you know, yak, yak, yak in this ear, and they're hearing, you know, all this. And and uh and there there'll there will be people out there who hear this and it'll resonate with them. They'll say, you know what? 
that makes sense. That makes sense. And uh, and I've seen it over and over again. Uh, people are searching for truth because there's so much untruth in the world right now, and they're searching for it. And um, and thank you for thank you for offering that that platform for people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. That that means a lot. Um, it, you're damn right. It's it's confusing and it's a um it's a crazy world we live in. And I just feel like it's a it's almost our responsibility to to do it if we want our kids to come into a into a world that is right. worth living with you know with truth involved mm -hmm. i mean that's a it's a pretty important yeah. pillar of humanity isn't it <laughs> yeah. Truth, yeah. Right? i would say so yes oh, man. um and so in in this time post covid of of so much division um a, a lot of people are still carrying around a lot of shit that has been not necessarily mm -hmm. um created on their own accord how how do we heal how do we heal from this and how do we move forward and build something build something better now yeah, well uh, first you have to so <laughs> i uh, during the during the height of covid when it was all masked and locked down and you know draconian um i i i came up kind of with my own recipe for uh, for uh, i i presented what if we, what if instead of, you know, looking for some sort of a, a jab, a shot of some sort, what if we just took a month as a nation and said, you know what, we're going to con concentrate for one month on building our immune system. Let's just, let's just concentrate for a month on building our immune system. Let's see, what would that look like? Well, let's see. Well, maybe it would, maybe it would look like we're not going to drink any Coca-Cola, Mountain Dew and Dr. Pepper. You know, we're, we're, we're going to we're not going to drink any uh, uh, high fructose corn syrup sodas, you know, for a month. We, we can start there and then and then uh, and then we'll actually we'll actually cook at home. We're going to we're going we're gonna, to uh, get rid of the, you know, the hot pockets and the TV dinners and the squirtable, squirtable squeezable Velveeta cheese. And we're actually going to cook our, you know, cook our meals and uh, from scratch. OK, uh, let's see. What else would it be? Uh, maybe we ought to eat. A uh, drink, uh, drink a liter of water a day because everybody's dehydrated, mm -hmm. and uh, and we need you know we need more water. So let's get some water. Uh, what else? Oh, we're going to get outside. We're going to get we're going to get uh, twenty minutes a day of sunshine. We're going to walk out and get vitamin D and uh, and get our get our sunshine. We're not going to stay in the house. We're not going to lock up. We're not going to cower in a corner. We're going to go out and get some get some vitamin D. And then and then. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna sweat for 20 minutes a day. We're gonna we're gonna walk or hike or run or jumping jacks or or you know yoga or cartwheels or handsprings or whatever we're gonna do. Uh, we're we're gonna sweat for 20 minutes. Let you know let our body expel all those toxins and get all that junk out of there and 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 and, uh, and do that. Then uh, let's see what else will we do. We'll um, um we we'll, we'll we'll sleep. We'll sleep eight hours a night. Um, because nobody gets enough sleep, we're gonna we're gonna turn off the TV and we're gonna sleep for eight hours a night and really get some sleep. Uh, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna only watch news one hour a week. And the rule is, for every hour of news you watch, you have to watch two hours of comedy. So if you watch, so 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 the one hour of frowning and frustration gets offset by two hours of belly laughing, and uh, you can pick whatever humor you want, but we're you know we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna laugh, and then and then the final one is um, the final one is we're gonna we're gonna take we're gonna make a list of all the people that we hate or that have done us wrong, and we're gonna forgive them. We're just gonna forgive them. Let it be. Let it be. And we're going to take that vengeance and that stress out of our life. I mean, can you imagine that recipe as a nation? If that recipe had been followed, um, I, I venture to say if that recipe had been followed instead of Pfizer and Moderna and, and jabs, I, I suggest that we would have been a lot healthier yeah. and we would have come through it a lot better than we did. I've got I've got three I could add to your list I think Joel. Okay. One uh one of them would be breath, breathe correctly through uh -huh. the nose. Okay. Number yep. two, we're gonna hug each other. We're gonna socialize. Yes. yes. And yes. I I think that's this and exercise. I mean sweat you covered that, but um sweat yeah exercise and also yeah. maybe breathe in some of that compost mix you were gonna send out. 
Yeah. <laughs> drink, drink out of the cow tank. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's that's beautiful. I mean, it would it would just turn it on its head. It, it yeah. and it just goes to show that if we were really, if we were really, if this whole thing was about health, you know, that's the steps we would follow. Um, sure. And would ban sure. cigarettes. It's not. It's not that. Yeah. It, it's not that complicated. Yeah. No. Exactly. Um, wow. That that's awesome. So. One one thing that is mentioned a lot in in this whole regenerative uh, regenerative space is the ability to build community out of out of farming and to create uh, you know little hubs or nodes of of places for people to come to connect to to get good food uh, to get inoculated to drink from the cow trough um, mm -hmm. to do that. So so what has been your experience out at Polyface with with that um, community building and I mean, sure. you're, you're an open farm, aren't you? Yeah, we are. So we have a 24-7, 365 open door policy uh, for anybody to come at any time to see anything anywhere unannounced and unescorted. Um, so we have that that level of transparency. And, and pe people do come. But more than that, we've really... Um, uh, we, 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 know, we know the value of getting people out to the farm to see it. And also to taste it. If 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 you can see it or taste it, that's good. But if you can see it and taste it, that's even better. And so you know we do we do a, a lot of uh, hay wagon farm tours. They're called lunatic tours. We do individualized tours called grass tours. Uh, we have we have a, a full time uh, team member that this is her you know uh, um, her business. She's a you know she's not an employee. She's an independent contractor and and uh, does these uh, grass stains tours. We also do seminars, but um, in the last three years, we've begun doing gatherings. We call them farm fellowships here on the farm, gatherings for for other groups, groups who this started during COVID when all the resorts and hotels were, were locked down. And we, we found out that there were groups that weren't paranoid, that weren't scared, that said, we'd like to get together, but but we can't go to a hotel. We can't go anyplace. And so we said, well, why don't you come here? And so now we've built a, an entire new, you know, enterprise of hosting these gatherings. We built a we built a nice big uh, three hundred person amphitheater uh, on three terraces. We we call it the the lunat the lunatic learning center, and uh, <laughs> that's too and, good. And 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 so people are coming all sorts of things. Uh, you know, groups we 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 have we have um, you know alternative economics, uh, health. Um. Uh, uh. What you know? Other things like um like bio fertilizer. I mean, uh. There there are just numerous kinds of things uh coming, and um and the the thing that we can do that nobody else can do is we can assure them that they have a memorable food experience and a wonderful uh bucolic pastoral setting. And so, uh, so we think that this is going to really, uh, we did, we did, uh, six last year. Uh, we're going to be doing six, maybe seven this year. And, um, and they're, you know, these, these are big deals, but boy, do they, do they build bridges to the urban community? They build bridges and that's what we desperately need. Now we need, we need people to come out, get out and, um, and immerse and interact uh in, in in a clean uh rural setting uh, just to whatever uh renew their minds if anything else you know besides all the the physical and uh breathing breathing in some good some good uh bacteria and and pollen and and, and listen listen to the birds sing yeah oh that's awesome um and i love the lunatic learning center i mean that that's awesome you should rebrand all your education products um <laughs> oh, that's, that's weird. Yeah. So and and so, what's the the outcomes uh, that you're seeing in these in these fellowships of people? Uh, that I imagine they're excited anyway during that time yes. to just come and be together. But um, how well, are they are they leaving? Uh, getting more than they bargained for? Are you, are you, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're they're, they're leaving on cloud nine. Uh, <laughs> they really are. They're you know they're uh, well. I mean. I mean, during the COVID break uh, uh, thing, I mean, they just levit, you know, they they had not 
been a place where they didn't have to wear masks. They hugged. And, and we, uh, David, we, we took actually as a business, we took a lot of heat uh, locally. We actually lost restaurants. We lost customers. Uh, it, it was very partisan, you know, uh, Polyface doesn't care about health. Polyface doesn't care about, you know, people's well-being. And so we actually, we actually, um, you know, took a hit on, on some fronts uh, uh, through this, but, but it also uh, endeared us. It endeared us to the, the 37% of Americans who have refused to get vaccinated. And, um, you know, that's, that's not the majority, but it's a pretty big number and uh, I'll, I'll 37% of Americans, that's enough to build a business on, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and, and so, so uh, we're, we're happy for that. And, and they love us. And yeah, it's, it's built all uh, communities where people, you know, get together and uh, they exchange emails and well, you know what happens when, when people get together. And so it's, it's just become a, a almost a, you know, a tribal, almost a tribal thing. Uh, oh, I found, you know, another person that, you know, that hasn't bowed to the government. Yeah. And that's it. And that's, I mean, that's, that's that truth bomb or that truth uh, resonation. I think that you're, that you mentioned before it's people are attracted to it. They're drawn into it because that's, they feel it, you know, it, it's, um, yeah. that's, that's amazing. That's, that's yeah, really, really cool. And not to mention that maybe the 37%, but then there's probably at least, you know, 10, 20% that were coerced or um, that didn't want right. to do it. And they, they felt like they were all the pressures. I mean, the social pressures, especially yes. uh, here where we are in Western Australia, I mean, far out. It was a, a brutal, yep. brutal 18 months. Um, yes. And still to this day, like that. Yes. And that's why I'm so interested in how we now, we grow out of this, how we forgive, how we, uh, rekindle right. those relationships because there is starting to the narrative is starting to go full circle and i feel like yes again places like like yourself that took those actions are seen especially in, in my eyes i that's that's where people you took a responsibility to build health not to not to endanger people but to to foster health and create an environment right. for people not just physically but mentally i mean it yeah uh, what is it? What's the the law of um, thermodynamics? It's a um, an object in isolation increases in entropy. Yeah, that's, that's what happened. Yeah, that, that is exa exactly. We 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 posted a, a pretty big sign there on our farm store um, uh, that said it's it said uh, it was titled "Masks: <clears throat> Your Body, Your Health, Your Choice." <laughs> And and we I mean, uh, we got we got vilified in the local newspaper oh, for, shit. you know, we, we you know, the, the, we're, we're you know, we're a super spreader, super spreader event. Uh, we, we actually had we, we saw once not not very many. Once in a while, we see a car drive in, they get out, they see that sign, jump in their car and, and leave uh, and, not, and not shop at the store. Um you know, but but yes, we believe we believe that that your health is your choice. My health is my choice. I'm not responsible for your health. You're not responsible for my health. See, the problem is, think about this philosophically. The problem is, if I'm responsible for your health and you're responsible for my health, then then you suddenly have uh, you suddenly have a, a justification. Uh, in fact, you have a mandate. You have a mandate to keep me from participating in risky behavior according to your idea of risky behavior. Well, I think I think feeding your coke th your kid th three cokes a day is risky behavior. Okay, so so risky behavior is actually a, a very subjective thing. Um, it, it's a very subjective thing, and, and so so the problem is that we have we have arrogated. We have arrogated beyond ourselves to society, to society uh, via the government. We have, we have arrogated to that, to the society, our health. And, and we thought we were freeing ourselves up from having to worry about our health. Somebody else will worry about that. But instead, we've become enslaved. Our lack of participation has enslaved us to somebody else's agenda. Full circle, isn't it? It's the same yeah. shit, different, <laughs> same, yeah. model. Same, same model, yeah. <laughs> same model, same same uh, same song, different verse, yeah. um, same results uh, too. 
just just a little, little bit louder and a little bit worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's that's awesome. Um, wow, Joel, that's that's really cool and and bloody good on you for um for taking that path and so much respect for you for doing that. And, um, because I feel like yeah that that the generation of you know fifty plus. 60 plus uh especially have been the ones that have been swept up in a lot of this um right and it's fear i mean they played on fear and that's the right. really it's a, it's a bad move it's it's, it's not nice um but yeah i, I, I heard to, a, yeah yeah i heard a phrase i heard a phrase the other day first time i've ever heard it and I, i've tried to use it so i'll remember it that's how i remember new stuff that i hear and uh so i'll i'll give it to you it's a new phrase that i maybe you've heard it i haven't heard it but they were saying uh this this lady was saying what we're what we're peddling now in our culture is fear porn fear pornography yeah you know it, it's it's addictive it's uh it's it's seductive yeah. And it, it and it, and it's not the real thing, but but that's what we're peddling is fear porn. And when people are fearful, they will you know they will they will fall for just about anything. Mm. Love it that I have heard that, and I have been using it quite a lot, um, and trying my best to stay away from it, to keep it away with a ten foot pole. That, yeah, that that's stuff. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Joel, can, can we talk a little bit about um, spirituality and, and um, cultivating? I know it's a very personal topic, and you can you know you can share as much as mm -hmm. you like. Um, but no. how how important is that piece? I mean, we we touched on the why at the beginning, but tying it back to that spirit and having a, a potentially a spiritual practice where it it I mean, I feel it that just brings you out of that reactionary state a lot of the time and just helps you to zoom out um so yeah i'd love to, love yeah. to hear a little bit about sure it. so yeah uh, i'm i'm very happy to share that so i i am i am a christian and and so you know in the morning i i i pray and i you know read read the scripture and i have my i have my time um but then throughout the day too you know um i'm trying to make my make my thoughts flee to something bigger than me and i think that that is that in itself, you know, what you're doing, what we're doing, um, I, I, I think that, that our entire view of food farming, uh, uh, the, the world, if you will, uh, recognizes something bigger than me. Um, the, 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 the industrial, the industrial conventional agriculture, uh, uh complex, is all about trying to um, to humanize the divine to to take to take what's bigger than me and a um, make it understandable b manipulate it uh, c uh, uh, impose my will on it rather than rather than me uh, looking at something that's that's beautifully fearfully wonderfully designed that that I had nothing to do with. And saying, what's that template? What's that pattern? What are those platforms? And then, and then conforming my my farming into that into that that was here before me. It will be here after me. It, it represents something way bigger than me. Uh, it's awesome. I, I would suggest that um, that when you when you think about uh, the infrastructure of uh, like like concentrated animal feeding operations is a, is a perfect one um and, and you walk you drive down the road and you see this w w when you think about conventional industrial agriculture the first thing you think about is here's what humans have done here's what humans have done um and and what i like to see what i like to to envision is um i mean for me it's it's Look what God has done. In fact, I, I like to think of, of it as, for example, when we go out at, at, to the pigs, for example, um, I, I love to take tours out to the pigs. And, you know, there's 35, 40, 50 pigs in a group and there's no smell. The pigs are happy They're You know, if it's early in the morning, they're probably, you know, rooting around. If it's in the afternoon, they're probably all, you know, zonked out, taking a nap on top of each other. But anyway, um, uh, you know, I like to stop the group and say, now, now. If you were driving by here 
at 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 70 70k you wouldn't even know there were pigs here so so we love our farming is is immersed and embedded almost as an afterthought in the ecology rather than the most visible thing about our ecology being what humans did instead our visitors see what what creation is and our farming is nestled into it as a footnote rather than the dominant theme of the ecology wow that's 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 really beautiful that's a really nice outlook on life and that explains why you're so happy <laughs> yeah and, and yeah I, I see the the creation and god thing i mean interchangeable with nature or you know mm -hmm. the creator um right uh, you know because it is it's bigger mm -hmm. than us and it's that sure. sense of awe that is yes uh, that really makes that builds that respect i think uh for that yes. environment absolutely and, and but also appreciating that we're a part of that um and yes and i think i just like to to touch on a, a bit of the agency piece about um because it's it's you could you be you could be led to believe that you know humans impact on nature now is is nothing but bad right um you know farmers are the ones wrecking the environment blah 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 um you know we we just destroy the place sort of thing but the exact opposite is true um in in outlier cases like polyface farms um white oak pastures or, or these enterprises that like you say are nestling into the ecology instead of pushing it aside mm -hmm. or killing everything and starting anew it's it's um it's fitting into that piece so uh what would you say yeah 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 so 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 i think i think the the important thing is to to start with this understanding that if you're if you're a a thinking uh, um, a, a person of integrity, you do understand that I, I could even say most of the human interaction with the ecology has not been good. I mean, look look at the de look at the man made deserts. Look at the you know uh, look at the destruction that civilization has done long before chemical fertilizers. You know, Alan Savory is wonderful on this. He said, you know, we didn't start destroying the earth when chemical fertilizers came along. It was long, long, long before then. And 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 my my point is that. But obviously, I said most. I said not not. You know, I didn't say all. I said most. So so the point is, the average American now who is well read. Uh, archaeologically, anthropologically, um, uh, carries this again this this kind of guilt that oh my look you know look at what we did look at what we did in Mesopotamia look at what we did in India look at what we did in you know in Easter Island or whatever okay look at what we did and and and, and carries this this thing that oh my you know um, I, I I better not touch nature because if I touch nature I'm gonna I'm going to mess it up like my ancestors. So, so we have a, we have an environmentalism of abandonment. We need to abandon nature in order in order to assuage our guilt. And so we lock up nature. We lock up nature in preserves and parks and 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 you know whatever uh, uh, you know hands off. Conservation. And, yeah. And, sure. Sure. Okay. So so. So I get that, all right. So here's 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 my response, all right. If you if you need to get down on your hands and knees and repent in sackcloth and ashes, do it, okay. But let's let, let's get it over with. Let, I I'm sorry. I repent for everything that my ancestors have done. Now stand up, dust yourself off, and say, okay. Now I'm going to use my intellect and my mechanical ability. You know, opposing thumbs. I'm going to use that, and we're going to remediate we're going to redeem all the damage that we've done let's devote ourselves to that so we so we come to nature not with abandonment but with a but with with a massage uh uh with 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 interaction and intentional strategic um uh healing the the, the healing touch that we can bring so these hands and these these minds that have that have harmed can also heal and 
And that's that's the key. And so that's the message I bring. I um and and I hope everybody listening to this, I don't know what all of your you know listeners are like, but um I, I hope that the folks who who thrive on making fun of the greenie weenies and the and the environmentalists and all those ah, ah, a bunch of nutcases. No, you know what? I think the first thing to do is to look at them and say, I get it. I, I get I understand, but but instead of just being, uh, um, you know, uh, tying yourself up in a fetal position, let's let's unleash our imagination and creative power, and let's take this abuse, and let's turn it on its head. Let's let let let's 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 build soil instead of destroying soil. Let's build diversity instead of instead of destroying diversity. Let's build nutrition instead of destroying nutrition. Let's let's do that. And and, and we have the capability, we have the know-how, we have the capacity, we have the money, we have the resources. And so let's roll up our sleeves and get with it and build a new world. Amen, brother. That's that's the world we want to live in. Um, and that's right. And that's that's what empowers me anyway, is that knowing that we have a role to play, that we are engaged in that um that we can make nature, we can massage her. You know, that's yeah. That's awesome. Um that's right. Like, two more things, Dale, then I'm gonna let you go to bed because I know you gotta um you've got to run early tomorrow. You're heading off to Texas. Um yeah. so okay, number one is I wanna just highlight um Darren Doherty's work and polyface film um that that you guys did back in what year was that oh my goodness um uh you're catching me off guard there i I, it must have been uh polyfaces polyfaces must have come out in i'm gonna say 20 about 2017 maybe 20 okay yeah yeah probably about 2017 it probably is when it came out so yeah it's been it's been out for six six years have, yeah. have, you, have you started to see it it ramp up a bit i mean i watched the film um a couple of years ago and it's it's bloody awesome um so i just wanted to yeah tip the hat let people know that that's out there um sure. and that you have heaps of other work out there i mean sure how, how many what are you up now in book count you can't even fit it <laughs> on two hands can you no, I've got, yeah uh, no i can't uh 15 15 books and i just i just finished uh, here's the here's the uh, rough draft of a new wow. book. Uh, that'll be book number sixteen. I just finished it on Saturday, and uh, hopefully it'll be out, you know, by the end of the summer. Ah, oh, sensational! How how do you find the time, Joel? Um, as well, I, that's something else I wanted to ask you. That's not on the included in the last two questions, but <laughs> just quickly, how do you, how do you manage your time and um, because you do it, damn, you you're a busy man. You do a lot. Yeah, well, uh, a couple things. One is I I type real fast, so I I I mean no, I mean that, I mean you know with today's email and all that stuff, if you if you can type real fast, that's a real blessing. Yeah. And so I I learned I learned to type in high school, and probably it probably was the most uh, one of the most beneficial classes I ever took was typing. Uh, and and I you know I'm a real fast typist, so so I can just I can just crank out you know crank out more material. Um, we don't have a television, so I don't, you know, I might watch, I don't know. I might watch, uh, two or three movies a year. I mean, we just don't, you know, we just, who's got the time for that, you know? Um, and, and, um, and so, yeah. And, and I, I guess the other thing is I, I love what I do. I don't, I don't go on vacation. I don't need to leave this, you know? Um, I, I just, I just love this. And so I love what I do and, um, I'm, I'm energized by it rather than, you know, I'm sure I get tired like anybody, but, but, uh, but I'm energized by the, by the opportunities and the possibilities of today and tomorrow. Absolutely. And do, do, you, do you have a smartphone then, Joe, or you, um, no, no, I've got a, I'm, I'm still, yeah, I'm still on the old, uh, the, the old flipperoo there. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going back there. That's, that's where I'm headed. I want one of those, um, because again, that's, I mean, how much, it's terrifying how many hours people spend on the phone and it is catchy off guard, you know, like yeah. you know, Apple sends through like a notification now telling you how, what your screen time is and bloody hell, it's, mm-hmm. it's um, it yeah. talk about feeling guilty, 
that's that's one yeah. way to <laughs> um right on no. uh last thing last thing joel i just want to talk to you a little bit about cole size and um pasture cropping i know it's mm-hmm. a, a bit of a left field from where we've been where we've been talking about and um what we've been chatting about but um so we have a course with colin i think we've sent it over to you uh, a couple of years ago um yes and, and yeah i just I've, I've heard you talk about it before and it's, there's not a whole mm-hmm. lot of you talking about it but um but you talk right. very highly of it so uh, i do yeah in fact in fact we, we did it we've done it twice here now we're not we're not in the grain business so we don't you know we're, we're not in the, we're not growing it for grain but we did we did try it uh two years just growing uh, some summer summer annuals like like sudex and cowpeas uh, for summer annuals for grazing for the cows, mm-hmm. and um, it was it was fantastic, um, and and it it definitely works. We we did we have not continued to do it uh, just because we you know we, we we feel like with our fertility level our ability to irrigate. Uh, we don't need, we don't need that kind of summer supplementation and it's expensive to put in, you know, you got to plant the seed, you got to, you know, all this. And, and so, um, so, uh, I'm a big believer and I've, I've promoted it, uh, certainly for people who are, who are grain farming. Uh, I think it's, it's a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic option. Totally. And, and even just that highlight on, on perenniality, I know you're big on perennials on, on your place and, um, and I think that is something that that is going to be a, a huge shift as well in, in agriculture is is moving towards a more perennial, um, diverse system. So, if we can just do that, I, yeah, mean, I think, mm-hmm. yeah, I think yeah. I think so. Uh, at least for the acreage that Bill Gates doesn't own, <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm confident that whatever whatever farmland Bill Gates owned uh, won't be in perennials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or um, maybe we can get in pasture cropping. We'll see. You know, <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, but it's funny though. You know, people get very upset about the whole Bill Gates thing. But you know, the the amount of land that he does own is what equivalent to still. I mean, some of the freaking oh, some of the sizes of the it's, stations in Australia. You know, sure. it's it's um yeah, yeah it's, it's nothing. It's it's nothing. Yeah. yeah. So um yeah. yeah, won't get caught on that, and and we'll just keep charging on because that's right what we that's right and, and um joe i'm so stoked to have this chat um and i hope we can we can chat again in the future i really want to get to virginia so if um if we come over yes um we can, please do we're gonna make a beeline yeah. beeline for your place absolutely you you're more you're more than welcome we'd love to have you thank you yeah. sir and likewise when you um when you get back out here mate uh you you make sure you let us know and and um, yeah. are you familiar with the the Haggerty's work, Joel? The, the Ian Haggerty's and Di, Ian and Die Haggerty, Natural Intelligence Farming. Uh boy, the name is certainly familiar. Um I can't place them right now, but certainly the name is familiar, yes. I'll send I'll send you yeah. a link through anyway. We've been doing a lot of um mm-hmm. filming and, and storytelling with them because uh what they're mm-hmm. doing is is quite exceptional and 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 again that blueprint at scale for um for healing landscapes right. um so I, I just thought that just came to mind so i thought i would ask mm-hmm. um but sure, when we sure. come out we'll, we'll head out there for sure and and uh get out in wheat belt country and and see see what they're up to get get, get down to uh, get down to manjum up again oh yeah uh, Dar- Dar- darren and lisa took us to manjum up okay. that was that was quite a that was a fun time <laughs> yeah we'll get get to the beach get you in your budgie smugglers mate um get you having a having a dip no nah, that's that's awesome hey joel i'm gonna let you go uh off to bed because sleep is important um but right. un- until we do it again uh thank you so much god bless and um all the best Absolutely. in your travels thank you very much thanks for the opportunity and and blessings on you thank you oh.